Hey everyone, and welcome to BrickCats. If you drop a like or subscribe, I greatly appreciate your support. Today I'm going to give you an in-depth look at the X-Wing models designed by Jarek and available on BrickVault. If you're watching this, I assume you've either already watched the BrickVault video, you've purchased the instructions yourself, or you're interested in buying them. Any of these three models gets my recommendation, and I'm really not aware of a better looking X-Wing model that has easy to follow and easily available instructions online. And by that I mean it's more than just a series of pictures in a Flickr album or something. I personally find those really difficult to follow. In this video I'm going to show you some of the highlights as well as point out some areas that are weaker than others. And I'll also kind of highlight some things that I think you should look out for if you're building this model or you want to source the parts. As advertised, when you buy these instructions you get the blue X-Wing, the red 5, and the white X-Wing included. Now I wanted to get into some of the cool parts about this model, and they're the same on all three. So the first is the forward landing gear, it's a ski piece. And then the back landing gear is hidden behind these hinged 2x2 two two slope pieces. They're a little bit difficult to get open, as you can tell. Once you do get the flaps open, the rear pads pop out. I will say this assembly is clever but also due to its construction and the way it's secured underneath the wing, it is a little delicate. On two out of the three models, I had a lot of trouble getting it to stick in place. The model is fairly stable on the landing gear. Jurek makes clever use of some colored slopes to represent the proton torpedo tubes. And here you can also start to see some of the intricacy of the sub-assemblies that make up the forward fuselage. The cockpit is a little hard to see, but it does have a control joystick and a little scope or heads-up display, and the pilot's surrounded with a couple of control panels. I personally don't like it when Star Wars cockpits don't come with a control stick or control mechanism, so I really appreciate this detail. You can see through the bottom of the cockpit, and originally when I saw this, I didn't like that, and I told myself, yeah, I'll fix that, but no, it's not going to happen. There's no room, and the bottom is too delicate to really do this well, I think. There's also some nice detailing in the seat, and the minifigure fits perfectly. I really love the spiral detail on the opposing cannons, which is movie accurate. And overall, the shape from the front is just perfect. The official LEGO models all have a similar way of doing the engine intakes, but unlike the official LEGO models, in Jurek's design, the small triangular support pieces to either side of the engines are set back from the edge of the intake. In the official LEGO models, usually they're even with it. The offset engine exhaust assemblies also look better than the LEGO method of using those 90 degree Technic connectors. And while they're not quite as secure, they're not going anywhere. The back of the ship has some nice greebling, and overall there's just a really nice balance of studs versus studless, and anti-studs under the wings, and then greebling where appropriate. I only had two significant problem areas with the instructions. The first one was page 34, step 16, which calls for eight Technic pin connector round two-thirds of a length. It's part number 18654, but I only had spots to connect six, so three on each side. I don't know where the other one was supposed to go, but I definitely did not have a stud where I was supposed to, and I tried to figure this out for a while, but then I decided it didn't matter and moved on and it turns out it doesn't really matter. The other area was when building the S-foil mechanism, you build these four sub-assemblies and then connect them all together. And it can be a little difficult to get the orientation correctly, as the graphics are sometimes a little bit difficult to interpret. Otherwise, everything went really smoothly. Um, I was particularly impressed that despite some really complicated sub-assemblies, they snapped together at really different parts in the instructions. And for the most part, I was able to connect everything without too much trouble. So let's talk about parts. Uh, the parts list you get with the instructions was complete. Um, the instructions do specify some parts in light bluish gray that don't have to be, um, or in one case, they're really expensive, especially in the interior of the model. Uh, for example, the 
the Technic Gear 12 Tooth Bevel, uh, number 6589. These are entirely hidden and they don't have to be light bluish gray, so if that's the difference between one extra shopping card on BrickLink and therefore saving $5 on shipping, then you should absolutely change it to an off color. Um, I chose tan just because I already had them, and three of them are inside, so you need the other four in light bluish gray or light gray. Um, speaking of light gray, light gray works perfectly fine in most of the parts that specify light bluish gray, um, and a lot of times they're a lot cheaper. The 2x2 spoked wheel with pinhole, part number 30155, it's like $7 in light bluish gray, and I just looked and there's some for like $0.07 cents in light gray. Also a lot of the off-color tans and dark bluish grays can mostly be substituted for similar kind of dull colors according to your existing inventory, or if you just want something a little different. There are four areas you really should maintain the color specifications. And those are the nose cone, the greveled area just behind the R2 unit, the greveled area at the rear of the ship, and the colored highlights on the wings in dark red. Those just won't look bright with a mix and match. The last thing I'll say about parts is that I found the armored shoulder pads. It's part number 88295 for about a dollar each from an international seller that had pretty reasonable shipping rates to the States. I think they make the cannons look a lot better, but they are expensive, and they're pretty rare in the U.S. in significant quantities. So if you're going to buy them, look international and be prepared to wait. Mine took about two months to get here. Putting this model together is mostly easy, with a few noteworthy exceptions. The 2x4 tiles on either side of the R2 unit lock the forward fuselage to the rear of the ship and those can be difficult to snap into the clips and then rotate to dive into the rest of the assembly. The top of the forward fuselage was the most difficult thing for me to get in on all three of the models. And to be clear, I'm not criticizing the design here, it's just a difficult piece to get in, and part of the problem I had at least was that it's really difficult to figure out where exactly you can apply leverage without breaking the entire thing. Your success here also depends in large part on how well you align the lower parts of the forward fuselage. So if you screw that up or your angle is off a little bit, it'll be a lot more difficult. Assuming you can get everything to stick together, it's fairly solid in the end. I generally don't have pieces flying off during the few times I swish it around. One thing that does bother me a little bit, and it's, again it's not anyone's fault, the engine intakes, because of the way they're connected with the Technic half pin, they spin around really easily. So the little clips that hold the minifigure pistols get knocked off of alignment. And it just kind of detracts from the look of the engines. The nose cone connects with a Technic ball joint, so it has a little bit of play, and also there's a tiny gap between it and the fuselage but it's otherwise pretty stable unless you twist it on purpose or accidentally bump it. The last thing on the usability or durability topic is that I was not able to get the S-foil gear mechanism to work reliably with the Technic axle key they use in the Brick Vault video. I always have to open and close them manually. Now I usually display these with the S-foils in attack position, and I think that's how you probably want to display them. When you close the S-foils, there are some significant gaps. One other issue I ran into was I find it pretty difficult to get the R2 unit in and out of the little slot for it. The connection that holds the droid in place is not very sturdy, and in my opinion you don't need the two claws that are specified in the directions. Omitting them means the R2 unit might jiggle around a little bit more than normal, but it's a display model, and odds are you aren't really going to be swishing it around too much. The stand is functional, but it's not flashy, which is not a bad thing. I like it because it has a pretty small footprint on your shelf, and you could easily make it a few bricks taller or shorter without any major issues. If you make it taller, depending on how tall you make it, you might want to add some extra width at the base, because if this thing falls over and breaks, uh, you're going to have a difficult time putting the pieces back on where they go. I have a feeling if this thing fell that it would just be a total loss, and you'd have to take everything apart and start over. A 
So each of these models cost me about $150 before shipping, plus the $15 for the instructions, and that's if you buy the Rebel Fighter pack from Brick Vault. Uh, I don't have an exact number because I ordered parts for a bunch of different models at the same time, and I kind of spread my orders out over time. But this is pretty much in line with what Brick Vault predicts your, your Bricklink price is going to be. This figure also includes the light gray substitution I made for the 2x2 wheel, but it didn't include the armored shoulder pads for the cannons. If you do decide to go with the light bluish gray 2x2 wheel, your cost is going to probably go up by at least $30. Also, the other expensive part is the windscreen, so if you have those handy from one of the official LEGO models, then you might want to consider substituting that in. I think that part costs around $5 usually. One thing that was interesting building all three models was how different each experience was. I talked previously about a little bit of the problems I had with individual parts, but each model went a little differently, and certain things that worked well on one model didn't work well on another. And I think that just speaks to the tight tolerances involved, which is in turn a credit to the designer. Like I said at the beginning of the video, these X-Wings are really impressive. They look great, first of all. They are pretty solid for a mock. They're a minifigure scale if you care about that. And price per piece is not too bad either, especially if you make the substitutions I discussed earlier. If you're a first-time mock builder, I think you'd have a really good time with Jarek's X-Wing. There are definitely some interesting build techniques and things that you don't see very often. And some of the connections are just so unusual and clever that you really wonder how Jarek figured out that this would work. The instructions are easy to follow, and it's not so challenging that a new mock builder would be put off. Or overly frustrated. I hope you all enjoyed my review of Jurex X-Wing models, and I'm interested to hear your experiences. Have you built any of these? Do you have any questions I didn't cover? Or did you experience any other areas of difficulty that I didn't mention? Leave a like if you enjoyed this review, consider subscribing, or leaving a comment. Thank you for watching, and I greatly appreciate your time. See you back next time.